Let's cut across to Arun Jaitley, who right now addressing a press conference on Rahul Gandhi speaking at the CII. Listen in. What he has been saying all these years and what he did emphasize yesterday. Therefore, if you start uh, getting into the issue of what really the problem is, and some of your comments which I've seen in the media, the problem of implementation. Let me go to the last part of your three subject theme, the imperatives of growth, security and governance. I think it's governance and the quality of governance which will decide uh, how fast India moves and in what direction India moves. The first aspect of governance itself is leadership. Now, leadership is the art of taking decisions. Leadership is not merely a position where you are elected to office. History is not going to judge you by how many years you spent in that office. History is going to make a very harsh judgment of what you did when you were in that office. And therefore, even if your stay is somewhat brief, but you are able to leave your footprints behind, history is going to be far kinder to you. The manner in which leaderships are to be created, leaderships are to be elected, decisions are not to be postponed, the firmness and the fairness with which decisions are to be taken, an understanding of where the core issues are, this will all be determined on the strength of that leadership. It's also important that leadership has uh, a clarity with regard to policy formulation. Now, if you are to say that we need to go back to the 9% growth rate, what's the roadmap to the 9% growth rate? Which are the sectors where the stories have gone all wrong and which need to really invite some action and intervention of the state. The leader must always have the last word. I have repeatedly said that I do believe that the present governance model is somewhat faulty. It's faulty because in a parliamentary democracy, particularly the largest parliamentary democracy in the world, it's the elected head of the government who must have the last word. And if the elected head of the government doesn't have the last word and he has to follow what the dictates of others in his party are, then perhaps you will end up with a three-legged race. And that's been the tragedy of this government all these years. He must have the authority to overrule. He must have a big heart. He should be able to sit with his opponents, even in other parties, and decisions which are in larger national interest, with his extrovertish style of functioning, he should be able to carry them with him. Some of the states are doing much better. Therefore, his ability to evolve a center-state relationship, even while executing those policy decisions, I think these are all important ingredients of a vision and a style that that leadership must have. In governance today, the leadership must have credibility. If a leadership or a government is an object of a suspicion for a large part of its tenure, then its ability to implement decisions and enforce decisions itself will be rendered extremely weak. Now, in light of all this, I don't think we are looking at a governance model other than parliamentary democracy. I don't think we are looking at a model where there is an intention by anybody to say we don't carry the rest of the people uh, uh, with us. There is no model we are looking at where we discriminate between the states. We are not looking, we, we have a governance model where you share power between the center and the states. There is power which can be decentralized, which has been decentralized to some extent. A lot more needs to be done. But ultimately, it is this political model which has served India well. Parliamentary democracy, which has to really function. 
we may have serious concerns about the quality of leadership and the quality of politics that democracy in India throws up. And that's an endeavor which democracies always make to improve that quality. In light of all this, let's seriously analyze where did we go wrong. There were sectors after sectors where we had success stories to write about. I did comment in one of the newspapers yesterday about one of those sectors. Now look at some of our best success stories. I remember when we were in government, one of the most difficult areas was the power sector. Mr. Suresh Prabhu first educated all his colleagues in the government. He educated members of parliament across the countries. He went to chief ministers. And finally, we came out with a formulation in 2003, the electricity bill. You started an effective implementation, the government changed. That didn't make a difference. It shouldn't make a difference in a democracy. And suddenly, extraneous events took over. And one of the most difficult sectors of reform, which was moving to a possible success story, two years ago, almost got caught in various scandals. Power plants were starved of coal. And today you have a sector which threatens to turn sick. Some people suspect that it may probably be India's first case of a subprime. That's where leadership had to determine, the Prime Minister had to step in. When all this was happening, you had industry writing letters, you had uh, members of parliament complaining. And you had a complete leadership failure when you allowed the sector to go astray. The biggest success story, I wrote about it yesterday, was the telecom sector. From 0.8% tele-density, you traveled to perhaps becoming the cheapest and the fastest telecom economies in the world. Even your selection of personnel. The first gentleman you select had a conflict of interest. The second one you select got involved in his own traps. So you had industry and investors suffering. You had uh, uh, civil servants involved who were uh, uh, caught behind bars. You had uh, various people that the whole success story had disappeared. And then I expected the third gentleman, my very dear friend, to at least break away with the past. Now, since he was cleverer than his two predecessors, he decided to teach us in the NDA lesson and said, let me detect an NDA scam. He went about detecting an NDA scam, he found nothing and probably ended up killing a half the industry in the process. As a result, you have perhaps one of the biggest success stories become one of the biggest concerns as far as Indian industry is concerned. It's here I ask myself a question. What was the leadership doing when all this was happening? This happened to power, this happened to telecom. I can almost see this happening to the highways and the rural roads. An important ingredient of infrastructure. You take a drive, I recently drove to Himachal and I found some of the best uh, possible highways uh, lying deserted, half complete. The developers have abandoned, there are conflict resolution mechanisms don't exist. The allocations for rural roads have gone down. I think as far as the economic management of the country is concerned, governments have to lay down a certain discipline for themselves. These three sectors, possible success stories I mentioned, the scope for ideological differences between party A and party B would be very limited. 
at the end of the day, everybody is speaking in terms of a possible 8-9% plus growth rate. You know the reasons. The Prime Minister probably knows it better than me. A government with almost no money in its pocket can't even uh, indulge in social sector uh, uh, flexibilities and schemes. Job creation, revenues, they'll all depend on what your growth rates are. The environment depends on each one of these economic decision making. It's very easy to come in the last year of your government and say, I am now going to fix timelines for myself. But somebody must seriously answer a question, why projects worth 700,000 crores are lying blocked? Either because ministers can't see eye to eye with each other? If it can take you months to decide whether an NIT is to be constituted or not? And then you say, now, of course, we have a cabinet committee which will be constituted. I'm still keeping my fingers crossed. I only hope uh, it does bring some results. Some of the taxation moves, I don't go into each one of them, are driving international investors away. 